Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Computer Hardware, Anatomy of a Laptop. So in this video, we're going to take apart a iBook G4, which was donated by one of my former TAs. Normally, we take this apart and I give one of the TAs a video camera, which they point at the laptop as we dissect it and we project from that camera onto the classroom's main screen so everybody can take a closer look at what's actually going on. And I pass around the parts. Unfortunately, that wasn't an option. And I also don't actually have access to the laptop itself. So these are all old photographs. Currently, the Gates building is locked and none of us are allowed in. So let's go ahead and take a look at our laptop here. So this is an iBook G4. It's about 15 years old. You can also see it's got a serious case of what is sometimes referred to as keyboard plaque. I mention this because some of you are probably looking at this thinking, Patrick, that's kind of gross. And it is, and honestly, I should probably take an industrial strength solvent to it and do some cleaning because as we'll see in a minute, this laptop is clearly never gonna be used anyway, so it could use some serious cleaning. And I will have to say, this is one of those cases where Apple's white motif here is probably not doing us any favors. Anyway, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take off the keyboard, take off the gross keyboard. And it turns out that this particular laptop is upgradable. And this is something that some of the larger laptops have the ability to uh, change and modify some of the parts. The nice, slim, sleek laptops do not have that, generally do not have that ability. Usually the parts are um, not set up to allow for modularity. Instead, they're designed to be as compact as possible and generally they're not, they're not serviceable. Okay, so this particular laptop, um, this is old enough so that it did not actually originally come with a Wi-Fi. This was an option and so you could take off the keyboard and there was a place where you could slip in a Wi-Fi card and there's the Wi-Fi card right there. Um, not shown right here because there's actually a, a metal shield that goes onto this. We'll talk about that in a second. And then underneath where the Wi-Fi goes, and you can see that this one actually did have a Wi-Fi card. That's what's sitting there. Um, it's been pulled out. Uh, and then underneath that, that is actually computer memory. So I could go ahead and add RAM to this particular laptop. Notice the metal sheeting that is covering everything other than the Airport Extreme Wi-Fi card and the memory. We're gonna go ahead and flip this over. And in the corner there, the missing part, that's actually where the battery goes. But the main thing that I wanted to show you here is if we pull off the back, again, you can see this metal sheeting all around the laptop. So this, this is basically going to completely surround the laptop. This is designed as electromagnetic shielding, and it's designed to reduce the amount of electromagnetic radiation that comes out of the laptop or that goes into the laptop because we don't want the laptop to interfere with other electronic devices in the area. So for example, you may have seen on various television shows the idea that if you've got those rabbit ear antennas on your television and you're trying to get the television to work properly, if you've got some sort of a electromagnetic motor or some type of electronic device, it can go ahead and interfere with it. And so this metal sheet that goes all around the entire laptop that is designed to reduce the amount of electromagnetic radiation coming out of the laptop and prevent problems like that. And if we take off the sheeting here on the back, you can see that's what's underneath it. Um, we're gonna be talking about this green uh, motherboard here on the left uh, in a couple minutes, but let's go ahead and flip it over first. Okay, so this is the, the top of the laptop. What you see on the inset here is this is the electromagnetic shielding that is supposed to go on the top of the laptop. It's actually been removed here. And this is uh, this inset is obviously from another photograph. Okay, so here's all the different parts right here. And um, there are a couple parts that I think are worth mentioning here. And we're gonna take a quick look at them in the overview and then we're gonna go into more detail on each of these. Okay, so here's a tighter in shot. That little U-shaped metal object right there, that is actually the Wi-Fi shield. So that is what it was supposed to be under the Wi-Fi card um, in the previous shot when we had just opened up the keyboard. I don't know why it wasn't in, in the photograph, but it wasn't in the photograph. But that, that actually goes between the memory, um, which was accessible. So you would take off the keyboard, 
there would be the Wi-Fi slot, then there would be this Wi-Fi shield, and then underneath the Wi-Fi shield would be the memory. And the Wi-Fi card is outside of the shielding because it does need to send signals. Okay, next to it is something called a heat sink. Um, we'll talk in more detail about that in a minute. And then underneath, or just, just below on the photograph, just below the heat sink uh, is the hard drive or hard disk. And it's actually sitting in the location where the battery is supposed to go. I don't know why it's sitting there in this particular photograph. The correct location for it is in the far left. And that orange cabling there is actually how data gets on and off the hard drive. That's supposed to be connected to the hard drive. And then that whole area on the left side, that's the motherboard. And we'll take a look at each of these in a little bit more depth. And there's the backside view. And again, that motherboard that we're seeing on the left of the main photograph is the exact same board as shown on the in the inset on the backside view of the laptop. Okay, so this is a hard drive or hard disk. The distinction between the drive and the disk isn't particularly important in this case, but here's the distinction. The drive is the thing that the disk is contained within. Since a hard drive has the disk permanently in it, hard drive and hard disk are largely synonymous, but you can think of, for example, I have a Blu-ray drive, which is a device that I put Blu-ray disks into. So in that case, the drive is the, the thing that you put the disks into, and you have a variety of Blu-ray disks. With a hard drive, the disk is permanently stuck in it, so it's more or less the same. You can see the disk itself here. It consists of a number of different platters. We're reviewing the top platter right here, and those platters spin around at very high speeds. The faster the speed that the platter spins around, the faster we can access our data, and the more expensive the disk. Um, these are the read-write heads. Um, they're supposed to be, uh, you can kind of see the, the sort of V-shape heading in underneath the platter. There's actually supposed to be another one of those on the top, and that got bent off and broken off during one of our demonstrations, so that is no longer with us. But basically, the tip, which is not shown, it's underneath the disk there, that's where the magnetic read-write head goes, and that whole assembly moves in and out. And by moving it in and out and spinning the disk around, we're able to access every individual part of the platter and we can magnetize it or we can read how, how that section of the disk is magnetized. And that's how we're storing our bits on this particular type of device. Okay, um, so some of you may be like, why are we looking at a hard disk? This is old technology. Actually, it turns out, depending on what you're trying to do, hard disks may still be more practical than SSD drives just because they are cheaper per byte. So if you've got a lot of bytes, you may be better off with a hard disk. So people will use hard disks if maybe they've got a lot of video, um, say they're recording lots of lectures remotely, or uh, probably a better example is they use it for things like video surveillance, where you have a constant stream of video coming in, you want to store that all. Anything that requires a lot of data storage, it's going to be a lot cheaper to use a hard disk or hard drive than it will be to use a solid state drive. Now here's the solid state drive. I don't actually have pictures of these. Um, I don't have an SSD at this point that I'm prepared to sacrifice for her demos. But it turned out there are a couple of shots on uh, Wikimedia Commons. So. Um, credits for these photographs will be at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, so this is what the solid state drive looks like. And you can see uh, the top left view is the external view. And uh, the bottom right view is when you actually pull the covers off. That's what, what's inside. And you can see it looks very similar to the motherboard. We'll be talking about this in a couple of minutes, but that's a printed circuit board with a bunch of computer chips on it. So basically the SSD is pretty boring. It's just a whole bunch of computer chips, um, which actually is why in many respects, the SSD is better than the hard drive. Um, the chips are much, much faster than the mechanical device. And also, it's less susceptible to things like vibration. So, like, I would always be nervous if my laptop had a hard drive in it, if I tried to use the laptop while I was moving it. But with an SSD, there's no moving parts. So 
um, it's it's just more reliable uh, and less things to concern yourself with. Okay, let's go back to our overview here. Um, and there's a motherboard on the left. And here's a closer view of the motherboard. Uh, in the previous shot, the heat sink was not in the proper position and now the heat sink is in the proper position. That's that big metal thing in the middle there. You can also see the memory chips just to the right of it. And we're gonna go ahead and take off the heat sink here. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about heat sinks. Uh, if you look at the image here, you can see that we've got the heat sink and then up in the top right hand corner, that's actually a fan. And so what the heat sink is doing is it's actually on top of the chips on the motherboard that generate the most heat. And you want a heat sink that is heat conductive. So some sort of metal that can conduct heat really well. And you want it to have the maximum surface area. And then you want to blow fans on it to try and conduct the heat away. So maximum surface area to maximize the amount of heat that can come off of it, and then some sort of a fan system. And so what we're seeing here is you can see that that heat sink from the laptop that's on the left-hand side of this image here, it actually does connect up to uh, another big metal section, which is right next to where the fan was. And then on the right side, this is an example of a desktop computer's heat sink, very large, often quite heavy. All right, we're going back to the motherboard here, and this is underneath the motherboard. And so we've got a couple of important chips here, um, but let's talk about the motherboard itself first. So the motherboard itself is what we refer to as a printed circuit board. And we saw a printed circuit board a minute ago with the SSD drive. So the printed circuit board, that it's basically got that green substrate that everything's on that is non-conductive, meaning that electric signals cannot pass through the green substrate. And then what we do is on top of the green substrate, we etch or laminate on thin lines of something that can conduct electricity. And that's how we send signals and electricity through our computer. And what I've got here is these two modules down, these two insets down below are actually showing part of a memory module. And I'm using these because I had the photographs and uh, normally, we actually take the motherboard and pass it around so people can kind of see what it really looks like. Uh, obviously, we can't do that. Uh, but I thought these two photos did a good job kind of giving a closer, tighter in look at what the printed circuit board actually looks like. So again, there's that green substrate. And then we've got some computer chips attached to the printed circuit board. And then you can see we've got these fine etched on or laminated on metal lines going through. And that's actually where our electric signals go. All right, so going back to the motherboard, um, in the top, we have the CPU or central processing unit. And then at the bottom, we have the graphics chip. These both generate a tremendous amount of heat. Um, and so that's why we've got the heat sink over them. Here's a shot of a central processing unit from a desktop computer. We can't actually take the laptop CPU out. So this is one of my old office computers, CPUs. CPUs for desktop computers are often upgradable. So they're designed to actually pull off, pull out. There's a socket that you can actually pull the CPU out of and replace it with a different CPU. Laptops are generally not designed for that. And the CPU is gonna be soldered directly onto the motherboard. But I really like these shots. It really shows how the information gets on and off of the CPU. So we see all these pins here, and each of these pins is being used for one of several purposes. First of all, there's a couple pins in there just for power. So, you know, our central processing unit does need power. I should also mention, so this is actually the package surrounding the actual computer chip. So we can't actually see the computer chip. It is inside the ceramic package. There are thin wires connecting the actual chip, which is again inside what we're looking at here. There are thin wires connecting it to each of the pins that we're actually looking at here. But these pins are used to get power, data, and address information and control information on and off the CPU. So imagine, you know, what we talked about earlier, we've got the CPU, it's connected to main memory. The CPU needs to access 
data from main memory. And so a whole bunch of these pins are going to send address information. So I'm going to set the address pins on this saying, hey, this particular sequence of bits I'm about to send down these address pins, that's the address for the particular byte in memory that I want to access. And then either, if I'm doing a read operation, either memory is going to send the bits at that particular memory location down and through the data pins, and I'm going to store that information in the CPU where I can access it, or I'm going to go the other way, and the CPU is going to say, okay, I've got some information stored in an internal data register in the CPU. I need to store that in memory now, and so I'm going to set the address pins to the address of the, sec of the bytes in memory that I want to store this information in, and I'm going to send the data through the data pins. So there's a whole bunch of pins. Um, as we've moved to from 8-bit computing to 16-bit computing to 32 to 64 bits, we've needed more and more pins. And so that's what all those pins are doing. OK, and then here's our overview again. And the last thing I wanted to mention is just the memory. So on the right, we see the memory for the laptop. And on the top left, we have seen uh, memory for our desktop computer. These are what are referred to as memory modules. Um, there are different types of memory modules. Uh, the main point I wanted to make here is notice how many computer chips there are here. So on the laptop, you can count there's four chips there. And then for the desktop, there's eight. Often there's another set of chips underneath. So it's possible with a laptop, we've got four on top. There might be another four underneath. And with the desktop, we've got eight. There might be another eight. But again, notice these are all powers of two because everything inside the computer is done with powers of two. And in fact, as we saw previously with those pins coming out of the CPU, those pins could be on or off. The address pins could be on or off. And so those are going to drive our binary numbers and our powers of two inside the computer. Okay, so that's our last slide. I hope you've enjoyed our little look at what's actually going on inside of a laptop.